Hello everyone. I'm Diane Samilas, the curator of Glenara City Council Gallery. I'd like to welcome you all to today's live online in conversation on behalf of Glenara City Council. Our conversation today features renowned Australian photographer Ponch Hawks and our two special guests, local gardeners, the local gardener and landscape designer Mary Graham and local gardener Laura Hesse. You were photographed by Ponch for the Poetry of the Earth series in 2016. Benara City Council respectfully acknowledges the Boomerang people of the Kuwan Nation who have traditional connections to the land now known as Glen Ira. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. I'd like to ask the audience to please start posting your questions on our YouTube chat and we'll try to respond to them to your questions at the end of today's conversation. So to starting off today's conversation, Glenara City Council commissioned Ponch Hawks to create the amazing Poetry of the Earth series of photographs, the Council's art collection, and for inclusion in the Curated Sanctuary exhibition at Council's Gallery in 2016. The photographs of the nine private gardens and the one public community garden capture the diversity of gardening practices in the community and explore the close relationship between the gardeners and their gardens. Our neighbourhood gardens are presented as earthly and powerful spaces which sustain, enrich and heal their owners. The Poetry of the Earth series and the Sanctuary exhibition was enriched by Poncha's mantelpiece installation, which featured fragments of the gardener's handwritten text on postcards, personal items collected by each gardener and details that Ponch had taken of each garden, gardens, gardener's garden. So there were fragments of jars of honey, gardening gloves, a sunflower and engraved stones, many wonderful personal fragments from each garden. So Ponch, I'd like to start off with you today, if you were happy to describe some of these fascinating, mainly private gardens in our local community and the one public community garden and what you encountered when you were developing the Poetry of the Earth series. Well, first of all, I hope we, you can hear me or do I need to unmute perhaps? Can I hear you? Can you hear me? Okay, Yes, fine. thank you, great. Uh, the original idea was that we would have to photograph the, some gardens in Glenira and if you like the cultivated domestic landscape as an architect would call it, but we just call it gardens. And so we asked the local community if people were interested in having their gardens featured. And so a large number of people uh, submitted and I went and looked at their gardens and spoke to them and looked for a, uh, some uh, diversion in the ones that, diversion, I mean, uh, some variety in the ones I chose. And uh, then I went out, spoke to the gardeners, interviewed them and uh, photographed the gardens. It also became apparent to me that the gardens were inseparable from the gardeners, or they were to me anyway. So it became a portrait exhibition and a garden exhibition, plus it was enhanced, as um, Diane mentioned, by these the objects that the gardeners found or made from their gardens um, to, that really enhanced things. It gave it a sort of personal quality and having it displayed in a sort of mantelpiece setting, uh, that, that it made you sort of feel like what we were talking about were private gardens really, even though one of them was not a private garden. So I'll talk now a little bit about the gardens and I'll start off with the community garden, which was a, uh, an alliance, a, a joining together of one of the local senior sets, centres and local primary school. Um, the day I went there, it was like Alties wheeling their trolleys or um, on their walkers and these little kids, quite young primary school kids, running through there. It was a very sunny day. And their hats were flying off and just sort of being elated by the idea of something growing, something they planted and it was growing. It was a really terrific um, sort of kind of partnership. And you couldn't have had something that was more different than my visit to a, a Japanese garden. And I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Shosu. 
uh, and his partner. And um, I felt like I was in Kyoto. It was very similar to going to a Japanese, well, it, was a, it is a Japanese garden. And then I went to visit uh, Laura who, uh, to her garden, which is basically an urban farm. And you'll hear more about that from Laura a bit later on. Then across the road from Laura's house was a Anne's garden, which is a much more conventional garden sculpted with quite a lot of artwork, including a beautiful bronze of Anne's dog, Ashby, and a beautiful grove of wisterias out the back. And then I visited also Mary's garden. Mary's also a landscape designer. And I was thinking today about what were my impressions of Mary's garden and my impressions of Mary's garden, apart from her fabulous dogs, were um, a sweep. I think that there's curves in that path and the, the garden beds sweep around. Um, and also it was a garden that was designed to accommodate other people and dogs, which I um, really appreciated being a dog lover. And now we've got Eva up on our screen. And we did for a we can go back. And uh, Eva's garden, you feel like you, you walk out of the house into the garden, but you hardly do. It's sort of like all in one, it felt like. And so there was nothing organised. I'm not sure there was plenty that was organised, but there was nothing regimented about Eva's garden. And there were lots of edible things and quite odd sort of plants grown in the middle of something and lots of uh, little whimsical artworks. I think you can see one in that photo there. And also a sort of feeling of uh, giving of it, you know, that things were, she was giving things away, producing things for people to have. And then there was Irene's garden and Irene was uh, of Ukrainian background and her garden was dominated by a snowball tree, which was the national symbol of Ukraine. And then there was another chap and he had uh, only native plants and they were specifically designed to attract birds so that he could sit on this porch and watch the birds come in and eat all the wonderful things that he had planted. And lastly, there was, uh, it's not the last gardener, but the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, Sean, who had a tiny courtyard garden, um, which went on to you know, one of the major streets in Glenara. And um, he was beginning gardening, I, I, I would describe. He, uh, he had has a lot of things in pots and he was growing um, edibles as well. And, Basically, he was learning about gardening and talked about how he enjoyed sitting out on his porch having a whiskey and a cigar and just watch the sun go down and think about how good life was. Thanks, Ponch. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, um, the Japanese garden? Perhaps go back to that and perhaps talk about the personal narrative that was played oh. out in that particular photograph? Yes, the garden... Uh, well, Sosu, Sosu, Shosu was um, influenced by a Japanese, famous Japanese garden designer called Kobori Enshu. And he was a tea ceremony master and, yep. and a gardener and designer and architect. And these ideas really influenced this garden. And this garden was started from scratch, so it was nothing. And, um, and now it's this beautiful, peaceful space where it's one of those gardens where there's, it feels a lot bigger than it actually is uh, because there seems to be a little, I suppose, in gardening parlance, Mary, you might be able to help me on this, that they're called rooms. Is that what it's called when you have a little space in a, a garden? Um, yes, it was a very, a very peaceful garden. And I, I must say that was there I first found the idea that you could tie up dog's hair and it might deter possums. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now we might start discussing Mary and Laura's garden. So Mary, I'll start with you. If you could describe your garden and your particular garden style, which seems very structured and ordered, if you're happy to talk about that. And then we'll move to Laura and the Elston Wick household. Thanks. Well, my garden is pretty much uncontrolled wild <laughs> so and it has lots of curvy shapes and um, lots of pathways for the dogs to run around and for my grandchildren to run and explore 
and I grow lots of things. I, I, I love plants. I can't resist them. So even though I do grow some edibles, I have, I have lots of spaces in my garden for edibles, which I grow amongst for my roses. But they're just wonderful plants. A few that I've inherited when we first bought this, this house. But I've, I've grown things around them and made it. Well, I think it's a beautiful space. And in my mind, as long as I think it's wonderful, it is wonderful. But the dogs have been um, also a destructive force in my garden. But there is always a positive with that because it gives you space to try something you haven't tried before. So I try to turn negatives into positives. And the dogs are exceptionally naughty. And, you know, Willow will dig holes that are a metre wide by a metre deep when she feels like it. So I'm continually filling in and planting new things. But on the whole, things, most things do survive. So and I just really enjoy myself in the garden. And Mary, can you talk a bit about the interesting combinations of the trees and shrubs and roses and perennials that you have in your garden and how I, that works for you? Yeah, um, I, I like lots of salvias and roses and lovely perennials like euphorbia diamond frost and um, you know there's hellebores and and little tiny gardenias that form nice hedges around around some of the pathways and mondo grass as well um, a lot of the things have to be quite hardy because when charlie was younger he was he would just run through everything so sometimes i've had to put shrubs in place to stop them running through the garden beds or just like a full stop at the end of a path so that they don't destroy everything. So a, a lot of the things I've done in my garden have come about through containing the dogs. Um, I do love trees, which means I don't get as much sun as I would like. I love crepe myrtles. I, I love crab apples. I love michaelias and jacarandas. The list could go on and on and on. I'm just besotted with plants, basically. Um, my, I do have a few things in pots as well out on my office step. I've got a kaffir lime just looking out the window now. I've got lovely little baby bamboos and, and banksia roses and all sorts of stuff. So I do actually grow quite a lot of plants here. Mm. Thankfully, it's a large <laughs> garden so I can accommodate it all. And at this time of year, everything is sort of um, luxuriant and, and overwhelmingly um, Full of full of growth it's um mm. it's soon coming up to a, a bit of a cutback so winter is a much calmer time in my garden and then in spring it all starts to grow again and it's exuberant and absolutely lovely thank you mary that's fantastic to hear a bit more about your garden and now we'll laura if you'd like to comment on the your garden the elstonwick garden your edible and sustainable garden and a bit about your particular gardening style. Yeah, sure. Well, we um, we started. We're, we're renting just to say first off. So this is a, a slightly um, it's an edible experiment, I think, in in managing what we're able to do in a rental property um, as opposed to actually owning the the land itself. Um, so it started six years ago um, as a share house. So five people living here and. Um, yeah, Herman's featured there with his white sapote tree, which he's very proud of. <laughs> um, he no longer lives in Australia, so I do have to give photo updates on how the tree is going. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's quite funny. But um, since the time the photo was taken, we have had, because we are a share house, we have had people move in and out. And um, what's really interesting is that the, the energy and, and the garden actually seems to reflect what people individually put in um, and in the beginning you know a couple of us did we're really into permaculture and we did a, a permaculture design course and through that um, we then influenced the other housemates and before you know it we'd all done the same course and so it became this really nice um, nurturing household of sharing knowledge and and skills and um we do group garden days and um, it, it would even extend beyond the garden. Like we, we would do, um, you know, sausage making or 
making apple cider and we someone would come across a whole bunch of apples from a farm that we got for you know quite a good price and they were taking up the bathtub and all of a sudden we had to <laughs> do something with that and um and, and fermented in the end and and so we, we've learned quite a lot from just listening to each other and lots of discussions around the the dinner table about what should be planted where and um yeah, so I, it's nice when it when you hear the term urban farm because that's what it, it does feel like sometimes. And um, it, as far as transitioning to a country property or while still you know working and living in the city um, and not necessarily making money or having a career based off the land or you know a, a home business or something, um, it's a it's been a really nice base to to share share knowledge and, and, and learn a lot. And the garden has changed so much <laughs> in the last six years that I've been here, depending who's here. And um, yeah, it's really nice, really nice to to get to know people. You get, you get to know the, the housemates quite quickly when you have to have these kind of conversations and um, share skills and, and well, chores <laughs> as well. Um, and, and even the, the pets, we have chickens. Um, so yeah, some people get really attached to them and, and some not so much. And, and, um, recently we actually had a, a chicken die, unfortunately, during the, uh, the COVID time. Um, so I had to, you know, send the funeral notice to the previous housemates as well, <laughs> let them know that unfortunately Bowie passed away. Um, so yeah, it, it's a really nice little community here. It's been really great. Fantastic. And Pons, mm -hmm. do you have any questions that you'd like to ask Mary and Laura about their garden? I'd like to sort of make a commentary a bit on Laura's garden, the urban farm, that I remember the first time. I know it's not quite the same now, but when I visited, mm -hmm. it was sort of astonishing, um, really, to see so much happening, so much experimentation, and to see people putting their politics into practice in or on a rent in a rental property, as you mentioned. Um, it was really uh, a terrific thing. I, I was quite inspired um, by that. It's really quite thrilling to think that six years you've still got that garden going. It's great. Mm. Yeah, and like I said, it definitely has changed quite a lot. And um, the, the group of people that live here at the moment are very keen on, on gardening too, and we're starting to research more um, Indigenous plants to the area. Um, so that's a, that's another step too that the different people bring, yeah, different insight into the land and and how how we connect with it changes. Uh, so Mary and Laura, I'd like to ask you both: Do you see your garden as an ongoing artwork, or do you see it as, as we talked a bit about your gardens continually evolving? Mary, how do you see your garden evolving or changing? Yeah, gardens are in a constant state of change. Like trees grow, the, the amount of light that you have is always changing. So what maybe used to be in sun is in more shade. So you have to adjust your planting accordingly. So it's about right plant, right place. Um, what else have I got to say about that? Um, I do, whenever things get too tight and there's no room for a plant, I found this lovely little um, stone bowl that was like a small water bowl. So in a space where I couldn't grow anything because there were too many tree roots, I just placed this bowl and it looks perfect. It just mm -hmm. suits the spot and it looks really nice. So that's a bit of art in my garden, mm -hmm. uh, in my front garden. And every time I walk past walking the dogs down to the park, I look at it and I think, oh, I love that. It's gorgeous. And it just seems right in its space now, whereas the plants were not growing well. So there's always lots of things that you can do to make to make uh, the plants happier and the space happier. And Laura, what do you what about you? How do you see your garden evolving? Uh, well, it's always um, hopeful, I, I, I think. Uh, yeah, like there is definitely some legacy of, of who has lived in the house before. Um, so, yeah, I feel um, I had to really fight for some grass space, to be honest, because we had some really keen gardeners that just wanted to utilise every space possible, whereas I was more about the feng shui of the, the area and where are we actually going to lie down on the grass and... Um, 
So where it's heading now, we, we have quite a lot of, we still have quite a lot of area where we can just relax and that's really important to the people that live here now and we've, you know, got a, um, a new corner dedicated to maybe some outdoor yoga practice, um, get, especially since the, the COVID isolation time, it's really, um, I guess, highlighted all the individual spaci spaces that we need around the house. Um, where people can have some private time and um, so yeah look I, where it goes in the future I'm not sure it depends who's here and who's taking the reins and um, but uh, yeah look at right now I'm, I'm really enjoying the garden especially having had much more time to do uh, some weeding and <laughs> and enjoy it a bit more and it's not it's not like a there's, it doesn't feel like there's lots to do now it's more mm -hmm. really enjoying being outside and um, and it's, you know, as time goes on with work and, and that balance of how much you invest and get out of it, um, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to go back to work, to be honest. <laughs> I'd rather just stay. So that brings me to my next question, which is really a question for all of you, including you, Pond, because I know you have a garden, is what gardening has represented to you during lockdown, so during the pandemic, when you've been at home and spending more time in your gardens and I suppose for many people, gardens have provided a sense of sanctuary during this troubled period in our lives. And there's been an interesting renewal of interest in gardening during the pandemic. So I'd like to ask all three of you what, how you feel about that and how you've re reflected on gardens and gardening during this time. Well, it's been interesting that the sort of the great toilet paper meltdown is reflected <laughs> the same way in the great seedling <laughs> Down because you couldn't go to the nursery and so you could get anything, had anything left, and then you go there and there was nothing because people were for the often for the first time buying stuff for their garden or they had time to contemplate their garden and they were just cleaning the place out, you know, it's like just like bunnies was they were rationing turps if you were doing painting. The okay. gardens were the same, people were just really embracing it. And of course, we all had more time mm. to work on our gardens. And Mary? Yes, well, my garden in lockdown, because I, I love being out in my garden anyway, it's not a chore for me. And always I would walk around my garden at least once a day and just look to see what new things are happening. It might be, you know, the camellias are all starting to come out now. There's always something happening that's new that I haven't noticed before. Yes. There's um, a fragrance that you think, oh, where's that coming from? So it's... There's a Stachyurus praecox that's part of my original garden and you only ever smell it. The shrub is really boring and unusual, um, just down the back behind the shed, but the perfume is beautiful. So it's little things like that. So with the seasons coming and going, there's always something different happening. So I like to walk around and do that. But autumn is such a lovely time with the beautiful weather. It's too soon to do too much work in the garden so it's a it is like like the others just a matter of enjoying over this time and appreciating and laura yeah um well like i said before it was really nice to have just a good chunk of time where we were all home to to get a chainsaw and and you know saw down a dead tree and do lots of weeding and like really reinvigorate um the feeling out there but I think it, it took us a good two months prior to that to try and organise a garden day where we were all home. Um, so until that point, we were doing, like, you know, easy maintenance and, and then all of a sudden it was gung-ho and we needed to buy steel cap boots and <laughs> all of these things. Um, but, yeah, look, it's it's been really great to reconnect to the garden and, um, yeah, uh, like Ponch was saying about the seeds, I had an interesting situation where... Um, I, had, I didn't have much luck with some seedlings. Some of them were expired and old or it was too cold. And, um, but then I, I noticed on a, a community um, page on Facebook for um, permaculture, there was a seed swap. Um, so I, I sent some of my seeds that I've been saving to this lady and in return she sent this really exotic uh, type of broccoli that I've never even heard of. Um, and a really nice note and she was offering all the seeds that she's been saving for a long time and felt like this is the time where she should share 
and give back to the community. So um, I've planted them and they're coming up great. So that's really exciting. Um, it, yeah, it really brings people together, I guess, times like this. And um, yeah, for me, it's, I'm really back into the swing of it. So it's nice to have had the time. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> uh, now I've got a question for Ponch. So, Ponch, when you developed the Poetry of the Earth series, you talked or commented on how you were struck with the spiritual connections that the gardeners had for the earth. Would you like to talk about that a bit more? Sure. Um, I think almost every gardener sort of talked about their sort of feelings for their garden, you know, the garden of a, if you like, you could summarise that as the garden as a connection with a greater human purpose or something. There's this funny quote from George Bernard Shaw who says, the best place to find God is in the garden. You can dig mm. in there. And that always makes me laugh when I think about that. But I think it's that people um, toiling in the garden, using their sort of bodies and working hard, which I'm sure both of our gardeners here are quite familiar with, um, and to come to a sort of sense of peace afterwards, you know, you're exhausted from that work and it gives you a sort of calm um, and, you know, and you can be overcome, as Mary has said before, by the sense of awe and wonder about something you've planted and, mm. and it comes up or an overwhelming sense of peace generally. I mean, uh, Josu talked about his garden being a green cocoon and, mm. um, and talked about her wisteria's being like an avenue of perfume chandeliers. And they were really things that really touch me and uh, the way people were connected. It's also about joy and quiet time and hope and harmony. All of those things, I think, are, are what are people's spiritual connection to their hands in the earth. Mm. And, yeah, and also the way you highlighted the powerful relationship between the gardeners and their garden and how that sort of that became quite significant in the series? Um, well, I, I think that um, it, it, that's, as, as I said before, the gardens yeah. are the gardeners and the, the gardens are the gardeners. Um, the gardens are the gardeners. Um, everybody, um, well, I suppose they put themselves forward in the first place to be in the series, so they mm -hmm. connected the gardens. They were in some senses proud of their gardens and wanted to be in it, but... You know, like Irene, the um, the person with Ukrainian background, and she talked about how at the end of the day, after the hard grind, you go out and sit in your garden and she's got this snowball tree, which as I mentioned is a symbol of Ukraine, and you sit there and the snow falls mm -hmm. on you. And everybody had a story like that. Like um, uh, Sean talked about how his wife's grandparents had... Uh, their peach tree had thrown a couple of seeds and they'd given them to him as seedlings and he was growing in some tins in the little courtyard on that main street. And um, he said, you know, this peach tree, it, it gives out beautiful peaches and I'm going to enjoy these peaches and my children, even though I didn't have any, are going to enjoy them as well. Too. Yeah. Mm. yeah, thanks, Pond. Uh, and that sort of leads into, I suppose, we can have a bit of a discussion around the cultural history of Mary and Laura's gardens and perhaps the cultural values or cultural history or family history passed down from generation to generation. Mary, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, uh, in my garden, uh, I have um, hydrangeas that, that I took as cuttings from my mother's garden. So they were originally planted for the school fete, you know, back in the, the late 80s, I was doing the plant stall in the primary school fete. So I put them there one year and <laughs> thinking, oh, yes, I'll, I'll put those up and we'll be able to use them for the plant stall. But look at them. You can see this picture. They're still there after all these years. And <laughs> I reckon that was probably 88 or 89. And they still flower beautifully every now. It makes me think of my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a really nice, happy memory. So, and I have another little section of my garden um, that was inspired by my Auntie Kitty. And I planted, I did just plant one gardenia in there. Poncho, I remember you talking, saying, look at that gardenia. It's gorgeous. And I swear that was the day you came to, to our garden. That was the best that gardenia had ever looked. <laughs> so, 
I'm glad you were impressed because I was. Um, so that was planted for my Auntie Kitty. And um, that's a nice memory too. Every time that flowers, I think of her as well. So it's really lovely to have plants that remind you of people in, that you've loved in your life. And Laura, there have been some interesting changes in your garden and an interesting sort of history, looking at the change in gardeners that have been involved in your household garden. Would you like to talk about that a bit more? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, one thing that struck me is there's a real legacy of people and what things they leave behind. Um, so Herman and the, the white sapote tree, Matt, um, Matt was a really keen gardener and he was up every morning weeding for an hour before work um, and he uh, you can see him pictured there with the beard that's Matt and um, he also planted we had the the plan to make a bit of a screen between the area where the chickens are and where we relax the grass and between the, um, the veggie garden so we talked about creating a screen we tried planting some bamboo and that didn't really take off strangely enough but Matt planted a salt bush and it's gone crazy. It's it's huge. So um, Matt's legacy is the salt push. Um, so I've had to send him photos, uh, photo updates of that as well. Um, yeah. Uh, so it, it's nice to see people reflected in different parts of um, of our space. And um, like I mentioned before, um, one of our housemates now, Kat, she's. Um, been interested in the indigenous plants of the area so we, we've started investing in that as well um, to what's suited to this area specifically um, on the sand belt here um, and uh, yeah and like Mary said well when my grandma passed away I actually took a lot of her plants and planted them all around here and that's really nice too to be reminded of my grandma just around even though it's a rental I, I think when I move out of here, I'll have to dig up half of the plants. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, like I've got a rock from my old family home as well. So it's interesting what, um, yeah, what a garden can uh, represent to you. And, and, and it, it is a, a tranquil place that, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to visit and have some, some legacy and, and memory to people and, and, yeah, and things. And I imagine it's going to be very emotional when, uh, when the time comes to leave this rental so <laughs> yeah thanks laura and um this is a question that ponch had um if you both if your garden could talk to you what would it say to you and mary would you i'll like start to with that <laughs> it would be get rid of those dogs that's for sure <laughs> Oh, they they do they really do such a lot of damage. You know, I have things that were once beautiful that now just look really tatty because Willow will not stay out of it and keeps breaking things. So I'm trying to repair that, and I'm stubborn, and I think no, I should be able to get this this um this plant to grow so that it looks better. Anyway, um, yeah, it is a, it is all about the dogs. You know, sometimes I think. I walk around my garden, I think, oh, that looks absolutely beautiful. And the next day it will be gone. Um, so it might be a beautiful flower, whatever, but Willow will have walked past and just gone, oh, eat that. And the plant, sometimes the whole plant is gone. And it always seems to be, if I have a thought about a certain plant in my garden, they, she will destroy it. So you have to stay very calm and not let that thought enter your head because it will be gone. Mm -hmm. anyway thanks mary and laura uh yeah look this is a, a tricky one i think um a, a, a bit of thanks from the garden would be <laughs> in order a bit of a, <laughs> um it's time to weed again um <laughs> uh no but it, it is interesting be, because it's a rental it's a different um situation and, and when we moved in here we could see remnants of the owners previous uh, to the ones that had just moved out who had also been into gardening as well so we could see there was this life before us as well some um there was a whole line of um espelier uh, apple trees and some were in good shape some were weren't but um and we tried our best to keep them alive but unfortunately they died but um yeah just signs of previous life and previous stories and um 
you know, some garden beds that had been left uh, and, you know, not much had been done with them previously. So it was kind of nice to see that we'd, we'd worked on someone else, we don't even know, but their story and brought back that land into something productive and, and edible. And, um, yeah, so that is, is, it's a nice cycle, I think, to see, uh, to see the, how, how things change over time and, yeah. Thanks, Laura. And Ponch, would you like to add to that? Oh, what would my garden say to me? Oh, we didn't say <laughs> bloody hell. Um, <laughs> yeah, do more work uh, in it, although, you know, my partner does a lot more work. I have my specialised areas, um, the orchids, the gardenias and the vegetables. We now have got a greenhouse. And now I've started a little orchard down the side of the house, which is the only last space that gets any sun because we have a big canopy at the back, pretty much. Um, so I think my gardener would be saying to me, well, you know, good on you for trying out new things, but, you know, could you work a little harder? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ponch. Uh, look, now we'll move to some questions from the audience today. We've had um, quite a bit of interest, which is fantastic. So the first question is for you, Mary. How do you contain a dog in your garden? <laughs> I have free reign through the garden, um, but I have plants that direct their energy around the garden. Um, I've, I've got, as the dogs run through the gate, instead of running through the garden beds, I've got a small buddleia that, that forces them to go around and onto the grass area. And once they're on the grass, they seem to calm down a bit. It's when we're not at home, the damage is often done. They get bored and they play. Even though Charlie, who used to be my dog digger, he's now blind. Um, he's been blind for two and a half years now. They still he still plays with Willow in the in the back lawn, and they get excited and just run over everything. So it, it has to be plants that are flexible, and that's where the perennials come in really handy because if things are broken, they will just reshoot from the base. So I try and just keep it to stuff that will self-resurrect um, as much as possible anyway. Okay. Thanks, Mary. And Laura, a question for you. So um, someone's asked about the Indigenous edible plants, if you could talk a bit about that. Uh oh I don't actually know what they're called. <laughs> there is um, uh, an Indigenous plants nursery in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and they had, they had a, a, a special day, uh, I think there was a sale on and, um, and some events. Um, yeah, but I actually, I'm not sure what they're called. They have uh, quite long names and we have them, the, little, the little name tag next to the plants. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, yes, that hasn't retained in my memory. That's okay. Um, but yeah, look, it, it's interesting and it's definitely something I'm, wanting to learn more about I feel like that's really important um yeah sorry <laughs> okay. and another question so perhaps Laura you'd like to answer this if you could say mm -hmm. one thing in your garden what would it be oh my god uh apart from the rock that I'm definitely taking with me um oh, There's a really good uh, little fuchsia in the front garden, actually. That would be, uh, I, I've always liked fuchsias and I don't, um, I don't have a real reason why. I think it's more of a nostalgic plant. Uh -huh. um, and then I, I realised that you could actually eat the little, um, an old housemate taught me actually, that you can eat the little um, balls that um, grow on them. So that was fascinating. One of my favourite plants, I realised you could actually eat a part of it. Um, so I'd probably take that, to be honest. And plus it would be easy to dig up. I immediately thought about what size and <laughs> the logistics in that question rather than just being wishful and if I could take anything. So there you go, a small, easy to remove fuchsia from the front. <laughs> and the question is just coming in, coming now from someone in the audience. Do you eat the salt bush? No, but um, actually a housemate did find a, a Zona who lives here. She found a, a recipe um, that 
yeah, had salt bush in them and we're like, well, lucky we've got a lot of it. So <laughs> I think that is, uh, that's going to happen at some point. Um, but yeah, that's, that's new news to me as well. So it's a, it's a constant learning, this thing. <laughs> and Mary, so if you could save one thing in your garden, what would it be? Uh, it would be, I'd take some cuttings of my, my mum's hydrangeas just to have them in wherever I went next time. So, yes, definitely. And what gives you joy in your garden? What is, is there a particular part of the garden that gives you I, joy? Yeah, I just think um, the peace and the calm that it gives me, you know, grounds me every day. I, I walk out the door to go to my office and I love it. It's the air smells so beautiful and it's all that oxygen from the trees. And um, I just, it just grounds me and I love the space that's being created here. It just seems right. Mm. And Laura, what about you? What gives you joy in your garden? Uh, I think the, the connection between people it, and um, what they leave behind. We, we used to have a trampoline here. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I would jump on that quite a lot. And it was really nice to just look at the veggie patch whilst on the trampoline. Um, another legacy I didn't talk about was um, in the veggie patches where someone's moved out. They, it, there's a bit of a history where Henry planted a whole lot of cosmos flowers because he wasn't there to look after the veggies so and then it's extra space so there's still something there and it looks good and until we use it for edibles there's this very brilliant patch of pink flowers um so he did that and then when matt moved out he planted a whole bunch of sunflowers in an entire veggie bed until we had the time to you know get that moving as well so um i do remember one particular <laughs> Uh, moment jumping on the trampoline and just watching this very vast array of um, sunflowers across quite a big portion of the back garden and um, yeah that that was really nice <laughs> sunflowers are really great <laughs> and Mary are there any Australian or international gardeners that you find particularly inspiring ah oh, yes there is um, Fiona Brockoff from, who lives yeah, down yeah. near Fantastic. Port Sorrento. Ah, just amazing. And my other favourite gardeners, uh, one in France, Nicole de Vessian, and one in South America, Juan Grimm. And the three of them all have things in common. They all create to be in harmony with their natural environment and they use, they use the local native flora and create the most beautiful, beautiful spaces. So I'm, I'm in awe of what they do. And um, it's nice to think along those lines. They use native plants and create beautiful shapes and, and everything, again, looks right in its environment. And that's a nice thing to aim for. Mm. And Laura, are there any Australian or international gardeners that you find inspirational? Uh, yeah, definitely. The um, co-founder of Permaculture, David Holmgren, he, his place, Meliodora in Hepburn Springs. Um, I think it's a one and a half acre block, but um, yeah, it's, it's a prime example of permaculture and integrated things. And um, I've, I've been there a few times and it's really nice to just walk around there and, and, and see how the experts do it. Um, and yeah, like there are so many gardens I enjoy, not just um, permaculture-based uh, principles uh, gardens, but um, the Edna Walling, I grew up in the eastern suburbs. So in Moorabah, there's a, um, a little section that it's an Edna Walling reserve. And um, yeah, it's, it just feels like old English town. It's really lovely. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's quite a lot. I grew up gardening, so I think yeah, all the family um, places that I've lived in, uh, um, yeah, it was quite still quite strong um, in my mind as far as you know, inspiring. Remembering a kangaroo paw from uh, outside my bedroom window and and little things like that. 
Um, there is a lady up the road as well. I must talk to her. She has the best front garden. There's not a piece of grass to be seen. It's all just this crazy jungle of edibles. Um, so she's inspiring, yet I, I, I don't know who she is yet. <laughs> and Ponch, what about you? I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about international or garden designers, nothing. I just know about what I do to do in my garden, but I don't know who the actual experts are. Mm -hmm. And um, another question. So how have sustainability practices changed your garden? Well, I think that uh, with all of the gardeners that I interviewed had all been influenced by sustainability practices, mm. tanks and solar and um, ways of thinking about doing, as um, Laura has indicated, and it's very strong in this area. It's a very strong sustainability group, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, and also, quick question, I think from the audience, it's a question from Mary. So, Mary, do you treat your hydrangea with fertiliser or any nutrients, or how are they naturally blooming? Um my hydrangea from my mother is is quite interesting because it has pink and blue flowers on the same plant which is highly unusual because generally you have one or the other um and i put compost you know i collect leaves sweep up the streets um, there's a lovely road not far from us. I'm not telling you where because that's my source of autumn leaves and I have to fight other people. I have to get there first and I have been collecting over the last few weeks before the leaves will blow away. But the, the autumn leaves are acid and, and that should create the pink colour. Um, so anyway... It is what it is. So my plants are pink and blue, and I think you can see in that picture. And and I, I do nothing but maybe just add some compost. So compost collecting is my thing. Um, I have two huge open bins at the back for all the leaves and lawn cl clippings, and three other bins for um, for just kitchen waste. And some of the neighbours give me their kitchen waste when um, when their bins are full. But I never reject anything. It always goes into the compost. Um, I'll buy another bin if I've got too much. So, but the bins find me. You know, people say, "Oh, we're moving house. Do you want this compost bin?" Yes, please. Yes, please. I'll have that. So I have a dedicated compost area down the back behind the clothesline. Thanks, Mary. Well, that brings us to the end of today's. Uh, conversation. I'd like to thank Ponch, Mary and Laura for your participation. It's been a fantastic discussion, really interesting and wonderful to see the poetry of the earth illuminated again and presented to a broader, broader audience today. Just a reminder that all of the images are on our website uh, with a bit of text about the series. So thank you all for joining me today and talking about gardening. Now, uh, I'd like to thank the people behind the scenes who made this event possible. Special thanks to Leo Damiani, our technical support, also to our Council's Innovation and Continuous Improvement team, the Arts and Culture team. A reminder to everyone listening today that they can provide us with their feedback about today's online conversation. So look forward to your feedback. Uh, this conversation can be viewed next week on the Arts and Culture Facebook page. So please share this with your families and your friends. I'd like to promote our next online events. So next Saturday, the 13th of June at 3 p.m., the Arty Noons for primary age school children with local artist Fiona Wood, Pet Portraits, and Sunday's live music session on the 14th of June at 3 p.m., live music from local musicians Dafka and Make Your Parents Disappear show. Thank you all for joining us in our online conversation today. It's been fantastic talking with you all and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.